This video was made thanks to our partner, Goat Guns. The military world is actually in a transition phase right now. They're switching away from building armored vehicles and weapons that were specifically designed for peacekeeping missions that characterized the last 20 years. The Puma Armored Troop Transport is actually a fascinating look at this military transition because the problems that it's facing in its development illustrate exactly how hard it is to prepare for the next conflict. It's been called the world's best infantry fighting vehicle while also being a decade behind schedule and millions of dollars over budget. The vehicle began development back in 2002 and it had specific requirements that were geared towards missions like Afghanistan, which will be long obsolete by the time the Puma is ready in 2029. I'm Chris Cappy, an Iraq war veteran, military analyst, and filmmaker. Welcome to Task and Purpose, the channel where we give you ground level insight into what's happening in the military world. So it was originally meant as an upgrade to the German army's 1970s Martyr, with more firepower and the best armor in the world. The Puma would have six dismounts and three crew, who operated one of the first ever unmanned remote controlled turrets with a 30 millimeter autocannon. It sounds outstanding on paper, right? So why did it fail a 2018 audit that revealed the German army would need to pay an additional $1.23 billion just to get it operational? And why did it fail its 2020 combat readiness test? Can the Puma IFE turn things around and truly earn its namesake as the fast and dangerous apex predator majestic beast that it is? And we'll find out right after this Goat Guns ad. In a world where regular sized guns are too big. Cappy, thank you for showing up. This is a very important mission. No, I wandered in here by accident, sir. We're gonna need to shrink you down with this Striker infantry fighting vehicle and your mini replica goat guns down to one third size scale for this mission. I mean, it would have been nice if you'd spent the extra money, sprung for the Puma IFE, but that's okay, I'm expendable, that's all right. You're gonna be going to a remote jungle island to fight an evil rogue ex-agent who has assembled a miniature army and they're equipped with an arsenal of the best goat guns available, like the Tan AR-15. Is this the shrink ray? Is, do I stand here? I, I might be a little shorter now, sir, but I'm also more down to earth. <laughs> Gappy, stop trying to be funny, you're not. Pull over here, Striker. I'm the rogue agent that you're looking for, Cappy. I was once a pawn like you too. Did you forget that these die-cast mini replica goat guns are supposed to be about bringing people together? And maybe if you were tired of being looked down on, you shouldn't have shrunk yourself. Was that a joke? You're not funny. Doesn't matter. Find out what happens next time on the adventures of Task and Purpose Goat Guns. The origins of the Puma infantry fighting vehicle started in 2002 when two of Germany's most prestigious and historical armored vehicle manufacturers joined forces. Rheinmetall and Krauss Weiff have been around since 1889 and 1860 respectively. Their joint venture would be called Project Systems Management and they each had a 50% stake. PSM was made with the express goal of creating the next generation infantry fighting vehicle and their creation has been plagued with problems ever since its inception. Major militaries today would probably rather have a bigger cannon on it and the ability to transport a full squad of nine soldiers, but the Puma sacrifices all of that so that it can be invincible. Having all this armor means that it has to have a cramped interior to the point where any soldier over six feet tall literally couldn't even fit in the back. I found a good quote about that from the German Army Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Vollmer, who said only soldiers of a specific height can get on this vehicle. So far, our solution is to deploy soldiers who answer this limitation. Oh, uh, you're over six feet tall? Sorry, you're gonna have to walk. No, I don't care if that's height discrimination, soldier. The initial base version weighed 31 tons without its modular armor kit. It was designed to be lightweight and small enough to be transported by air because in 2002, it was important to get to remote locations like Afghanistan. In order to make the vehicle attractive to more countries that PSM wanted to sell to, they needed to target what those markets were looking for then. The armored vehicle world market makes up $25.5 billion of world trade. And Germany is number four in the top exporters of armored vehicles with over $380 million worth of exports in 2019 alone. So you can see the value of being able to convince an allied country to buy these weapons. Puma's managing director, Rainer Huth, said this in 2005, the whole design of the Puma is oriented towards mine protection. Crew protection must have absolute priority, end quote. Well, it turns out protection is not the most important thing. And I know that sounds counterintuitive for a soldier to say, but hear me out. 
I can appreciate wanting better landmine protection. In the strikers that I rode around in in Iraq, we basically had a thin sheet of baking tinfoil aluminum armor between me and potential landmines. We had to actually do our own modular armor by placing stacks of sandbags under our feet in the vehicles. Yes, the absolute height of technology, sand wrapped in green plastic bags. So I understand that the variable of protection is important, but there are other key variables that need to be addressed that it seems like the Puma might be failing at. Which brings us to the electronics. So in a 2018 interview with the German chief of staff, he was asked why the Puma only has black and white displays in it. Yes, you heard me correctly, it only has black and white monitors on a remote controlled vehicle that relies entirely on its monitors for situational awareness and targeting. If you checked into a hotel and they only had black and white TVs, would you stay there? So it had some outdated electronics, that's no big deal, right? Well, according to defensenews.com, an article in 2018, the German army reported that the Puma had a lack of system stability. They said the primary weapon would often malfunction during training. I get it. Sometimes when you push the envelope in design and engineering, you have to work out the bugs for a period of time. This was one of the first IFBs in the world to have an unmanned turret system, which, okay, so there's pros and cons to an unmanned turret system. It's harder to maintain, but on the other hand, can be smaller and lower profile, lighter weight, the turret is faster, more responsive for the crew inside. If the turret gets hit, the crew is still safe. In traditionally manned turrets though, if the electronics or cameras fail, the crew can still operate the turret and they can fire through the periscope. Having an unmanned turret instead of a manned turret also allows for the possibility of a remote controlled gunner situation, where the gunner is operating the vehicle from hundreds of miles of away remotely. So on unmanned turrets, there's a problem where sometimes the crew loses their orientation because you're not actually physically seeing which direction the turret is in. You have to rely on your displays. 2018 was truly a rough year for the Puma's development life. The vehicle was audited by German lawmakers from the Bunden Heivenstrauf. It's basically like the Better Business Bureau in the United States. And their report found that only 43% of Puma vehicles were deployment ready in 2017 and that it would take another $1.23 billion to upgrade the Puma's displays, radios, and anti-tank features. I think there's a very real possibility that even though the Puma is amazing, it's obsolete. It's like if you made the best record player. Sure, it's the best record player, but nobody wants it anymore. And to add insult to injury, the German army would have to spend millions of dollars to upgrade their old 1970s martyr or IFVs in the meantime, waiting for the Pumas to be ready. Now, all of this kind of reminded me of something I read in an old 2013 United States Congressional Budget Office investigation document, which was all about the Army's attempt to replace the Bradley. And yes, I don't have a life, I read these things in my spare time. The CBO actually found that the Puma would be the best possible replacement for the Bradley, and that, quote, the Puma also poses a lower programmatic risk of cost, growth, and schedule delays, end quote. They really dodged a bullet there, they were wrong about that because there were a lot of scheduled delays after 2013 and there were a lot of additional costs. So instead of the US Army having to pay for all those upgrades that it needed, they ended up sticking with the M2 Bradley and upgrading that instead. So I've run into a problem here. I sound like I'm making the argument that the Puma is awful, but that's really not the case. And it's, it's actually way more complicated than that. So the vehicle is way better than the M2 Bradley. According to the report, it would be much more lethal than any other vehicle that the CBO evaluated. It would confer an estimated improvement in capability of 45% relative to the current IFV. I needed to explain all of the problems facing the Puma so we could tell the other part of the story now, which is whether or not Remental, AKA Project Systems Management, can solve all of these problems. Because at the end of the day, every vehicle will have problems but not every company can solve them. So what did the Puma get correct? And can they fix the problems? Its cannon has a unique ability that I haven't seen anywhere else. The unique muzzle brake actually measures the velocity of each round, programs a fuse timer into the airburst anti-personnel munition. So when it detonates out in the air, it sends out a lethal cone of 162 tungsten sub projectiles, which are perfect for destroying enemy infantry formations. The gunner can even adjust the size of this lethal cone dispersion to be either really narrow or wide, depending on the threat. The United States CBO report says that the army experts who assessed the weapon found that it would be a full 103% more lethal than the current 25 millimeter Bradley IFB. That's worth hanging on the fridge at home. 
I know what it's like to be a clueless grunt sardined into the back of a dark armored hull with zero idea of what's going on outside the vehicle. With the Puma, that's not the case. There are 11 external cameras that display to the dismounts what's happening around outside. This way they know where to take cover once they exit the back of the vehicle. But what about maneuverability? What has this vehicle done to earn its code name of the Puma? It's a 10 cylinder 890 rank engine with 1,100 horsepower. That's twice the Bradley. It allows it to travel 15 kilometers per hour or about 10 miles per hour faster than any other IFB. And if that wasn't enough, it has a unique ability to go six speeds in reverse as well as forward. And it would equate to about 28% fewer casualties according to the United States 2013 CBO report. This engine produces enough electricity to run vital defense systems. Not having enough electrical power is actually a common problem that militaries who are attempting to upgrade their old IFVs, they're running into that problem. It will have the MUS multifunctional self-protection system, which is this pod that provides 360 degree protection by sensing incoming IR and wire guided missiles, and then it automatically warns the crew and it jams those missile systems. It auto deploys smoke, which disturbs the incoming missiles from tracking them. They're adding a MELS Spike LR anti-tank guided missile system attached to the side of the turret. In its level A configuration, it's easy to transport and you can see how they can just continue to upgrade it with new types of armor. The armor is made out of a nanometric steel and ceramic technology that's 30% less thick and 60% more lightweight while offering twice the protection as traditional armor. With the Puma IFV, you're getting everything on brand. Whenever I buy off-brand cereal, it's gross, and I immediately go back to pay the extra two bucks to get that good stuff. But you see where that money is going. Official armor tests show that the RPG-7 will penetrate less than 10 millimeters of the Puma's armor. And the rumor is it stops way more than that too, but it's top secret what the actual limit to the armor is. By making that armor modular though, it allows the crews to simply replace sections that are damaged, like when my O2 Toyota Camry got keyed, so I only had to replace the door because it was modular. But you have to wonder, what was sacrificed with all that focus on armor? Another huge advantage that the Puma has that you can't really say about its competition like the Russian T-15 Armada is that the Puma already has its production line in order. They've already produced over 345 as of October 2020, and they've proven they can iterate and improve which is no small manufacturing feat. It appears as if the defense industry's unhealthy obsession with modularity is finally paying off. What with all these articles and reports about the Puma's delays, they seem to miss the fact that, you know what, it takes 20 years to perfect a new vehicle and it's constantly being upgraded throughout its lifetime. So I expect that they'll need another upgrade 10 years from now again. The true test, however, will be when the vehicle first sees combat. Do you agree with my assessment of the Puma? Or do you think I failed to highlight some important aspect? If you made it to this part of the video, I figure you might be one of the people interested in getting my first piece of merch, the Modular Musket t-shirt, which you can grab from the YouTube store below. I'm your host, Chris Cappy. Follow me on Instagram at Cappy Army to see my live updates testing out new military equipment this year. I'll see you guys in the video next week.